This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is the ties that bind. My co-host, Beatrice, is on a plane and to get here to be on time, but she'll be with us next week. So, let me tell you a little bit about the ties that bind. History is a reminder of what's possible. These are the words spoken by President George W. Bush as he emerged from a guided tour of the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Hmm. And now we begin this series, young and old alike, to take a look at the past, our past, your past, the past that is not seen in the history books, books that are his story, what we refer to as mirrors of the past, but we as colonialized people, indigenous people, people of color, look into the mirror and do not see ourselves. In the letter from the Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King wrote, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied with a single bar garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects us all indirectly. We can never again rest with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with the effects and not the underlying causes. So today, we examine the underlying causes. And my guest today is a dear friend, <laughs> Dave Mulnex, who is going to talk to us about a hidden heritage. Mm. He is Native American from the Wabash Confederacy or Wabash tribes, which is, which is right, which is... It, it is just it, talks about the area, so yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marcia, for having so, me on. So tell us about you being Native American yeah. and what that means. Mm. What, what does that mean to you? I know it, it has a, again, what the history books tell us, but what, but you are what? fourth, fifth generation of, from the Wabash tribes, is yeah. that what it is? Yeah. So t tell us what, what being Native American means to you. I didn't, um, you know, grow up in that society, you know, because uh, we lived in the farm country of Ohio, and uh, my grandpa's mom, you know, wasn't uh, on the reservation, they, they had a farm. So, uh, but my grandpa would tell me stories, and uh, so, um, to me, it, 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 it's like a way of life. It's a way of seeing the world. You know, indigenous people have a whole different concept of the world than, you know, Western civilization. And that, um, like, the mother is our mother. Mother Earth is our mother. It's not a, you know, a, a stone floating through space. This is actually our mother, you know. And if the creator is, is with us at all times, there is no separation. We don't need anybody to intercede in between that um, the Creator is in every fiber of our being. So there's certain things that, um, awarenesses that I've always had, you know, and my grandpa would, I think, would reinforce. So I was always having a hard time in American society because things didn't make any sense. You know, like my, like my mother just didn't lie. So I grew up not lying. I didn't know, you know, that uh, they didn't have to lie. We could tell my mom anything and she, you know, we knew we were really caught anyway because she, Mom's always you know, smart. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah, your mom knows, so what the hell? You might as well tell her. So uh, so being honest, you know, uh, and the other thing is that that um, from an indigenous perspective, uh, which is kind of like, I think that that was the whole basis of socialism and communism, is that you look out for the people first. You know, you're looking out for others before you're looking out. You're making sure that everybody gets something to eat, that everybody has a place to sleep, that everybody is you know, taken care of. You're not just looking out for yourself. So those are basic indigenous uh, concepts that I that I grew up with. That 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 as I went through the world. So, um, but it was quite a challenge because the rest of the world doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know, we the American society is winner take all. It's all about it's all about me. You know, what can I get for me? And then when I get with my, then maybe I'll share some. I'll make some donations or whatever. But what can I get for me? And it's and it's and it's that kind of capitalist. That kind of um, 
greed, really, because I can get all I want and I don't have to share with anybody. Uh, and so the people who really are in need aren't being looked out for, you know. So we have all these homeless people. We've got indigenous people. We've got uh, people of color, uh, women, gays, all these different groups of folks that aren't being taken care of because everybody's looking out for themselves. Well, I find that strange because the three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and uh, Muslims, yeah. All of them in their Bibles, in their books, it they all have the same thing. It yeah. says that you uh, feed the hungry, care for the sick, clothe them. And it tells you how to care for these people, and yet they don't do it. Yeah. But that that's the same in each, each one of those books. It's absolutely the same. Right. So there, there's... There's a disconnect there between yeah. what they profess and what they do. Yeah, and that's, that's um, because, well, the Bible, I mean, you know, uh, everybody can read it and get out of it what they want. I mean, the, the basically, it's, you have to interpret it. You cannot read it straight. You no. have to interpret it. And so that's why the Klan and the civil rights marchers, you know, that movement, were reading the same book and getting exactly, exactly different information from the same book. Yes. Yeah, you because know, it's all interpretive. But from an indigenous perspective, uh, it's about making your connection with the creator yeah. and, uh, and the basic principles of you know, loving your, your people and loving your nation and loving the earth. So no matter what information you might feel you're getting from the creator for your path, that's always going to be in there, you know? Well, now tell us about, for most of us that don't know, uh, the you were from the Wabash tribes, or yeah, Wabash Confederacy, Wabash yeah. tribes. What uh -huh. what what does that mean? Well, uh, so so there's a lot of different mixture, and things changed over the years because there was different wars and different confederacies and all that. But so uh, the one group that uh, my family's from is the Cherokee and Delaware and Lenape. They, they got there. So the, my, one group of my family is waiting on the beach in Delaware while the other group of my family ends up on the beach eventually. That all comes to pass. Uh, and then there's the uh, Potawatomi, Miami uh, uh, tribes. So um, they, the Delaware, I think they had 37 treaties, more treaties broken by the United States than any other nation. Uh, and started out in Delaware and ended up in Oklahoma and eventually uh, were even disenfranchised as a, as a, as a nation. So, uh, um, but there, there was a big war in Ohio over beaver and uh, that was where the French were, Indian War was all about getting the resources there for the beaver. And when that war was lost, then everybody was sent to Indiana. So that was like the first Oklahoma. And so um, that's where our people agreed to, you know, live like the white man and, you know, have towns and villages and all that. Um, and that was, and there was one more big war that was Tecumseh. He tried to bring all the, he's a Shawnee, he tried to bring all the tribes together. This is one of my heroes as a child uh, because he was trying to bring all the tribes together to, to, to stand up, to, to protect, you know, if we all get together, we can, we can stop these Americans from taking our land. And so he was making this huge confederacy. And uh, so he had that going in Indiana, and, um, but the governor attacked the village and they murdered Tecumseh and that was kind of the end of that resistance. The, the American govern, governor of Indiana? Yeah, that, yeah, that? yeah, he became president eventually. Who was this? Oh, I'm trying to remember his name right now. But yeah, he, he became, that, that was one of his big, you know, you gotta, be, you gotta be a general and kill people and then you can become president. I mean, it was, was kind that of. Was that Harrison? Yeah, I think that was Harrison. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So then later on, uh, in the 18, later on in the 1800s, um, the Potawatomi, the, my, the other part of my family tree, um, they were li you know, living in the regular, way they were supposed to live and peaceful. All the wars were all over by this point. And the people and the government decided, we're just going to take the Potawatomi land. We're going to take all the Indian land. So they, they, had, they, they double crossed the, the Delaware or, and, uh, and tricked them out of their land. And um, uh, that's an incredible story. But um, the, they said, okay, we're going to take it. And so they, they sent the state militia up to the, to the town. They were, in, they were in church, you know, everybody's in Sunday school. And, uh, and behind the militia is all these wagons of white people. 
and they and they come up to the to the town and they say you're evicted and the and the chief goes no we got to treat the United States and they said well that that's Washington D.C. is like a long way from here that's the and the U.S. Army can't get here to do anything about this you're leaving today so they threw them into open wagons they didn't give them a chance to get anything you know and uh, force marched them towards Kansas well it was you know late fall early winter. And so the uh, old people died, uh, the babies died, the children died, um, and one of my one of my great grandmothers was was on that. She was a baby, and is, she survived that. Now, is that like the Trail of Tears? It was called the Trail of Death, and that was trail just prior death. to the Trail of Tears. So that so was. There were five different Trail of Tears. So yeah. what's this was this was the Trail of Death. Trail of Death. They call it the Trail of Death because it was prior to that, because it was basically a forced march and, and people were just dying. And they didn't provide anything for them. Yeah, you know, they didn't give them, they didn't bring along any food, any water, any warm blankets or clothing. Just, you know, we're going, just get out of here. So it was really, racism and, and brutality was really rampant in those days, you know, and they didn't consider them, even though they were good Christians, they didn't consider them, you know, human beings, you know, so they, so they forced them out. She eventually, um, Ended up in uh, they mentioned in Missouri. Missouri had a big uh, Daniel Boone moved to right. Missouri, and yes. so that was you know a frontier. And she moved there, and uh, and married a, married a white man, and they had a farm, and everything was going great. And then Missouri passed because because of the Trail of Tears. Right, they passed a law: no Indians can live in Missouri, and if you do, you can't own anything. Right. So uh, if her husband had died, then everything that she owned, her farm animals, any money that they had, any white man could come and just take it all and leave her absolutely destitute. And they realized that was not what they, you know, that was not good. So they moved from Missouri over to Iowa and that's where they finally settled and then eventually to Michigan. But anyway, that, so that's, that's kind of the, you know, so she was pretty, pretty strong. They had a big battle, there's Carthage, Missouri. They had a big Civil War battle there and they had cannons firing and the two armies fighting back and forth through the town and, and uh, she was pregnant and had a couple of toddlers, and there's these bullets flying through the town and, you know, and all this battle, and, and uh, so she was a pretty tough cookie. Now, I have a great-great-grandmother. Yeah. Who, at, when I was a child, and this is Indiana. Yeah. So I was told that she was Blackfoot. Yeah. And it was only a couple of years ago that I found out the truth yeah. that she was uh, Choctaw, Chick what is it? Cherokee? Probably, probably Cherokee, yeah. yeah, Cherokee. Yeah. And that she was on the Trail of Tears mm -hmm. and uh, my great-grandfather was a freed black man and they took her, his family took her in yeah. and married her because to this because they're the same age, so they yeah. married her to protect her. Yeah. And then they lied about saying that she was Blackfoot yeah. to protect her right. and from the bounty hunters, because right. they were bounty hunters to right. get all of the, any Indians that escaped, right. to take them back, right. and they, they got paid for them. So my uncle told me as a child, he absolutely loved spending time with her because they had hiding places. Yeah. And all little children love hiding places, you yeah. know. Yeah. And he said it was easier to be uh, black than it was to be Indian. Right. And I, it just took, for years I couldn't figure, what does he mean, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I go, well, how could that be? Right. So. Well, I mean, it had to do with the genocide. I, yeah. mean, you know, I mean, slavery was... It, it couldn't get much more horrendous well, than slavery. slavery yeah. But genocide's, you know, one more step mm -hmm. into that. And so Indians, you could just kill them, you know. I mean, slaves, you're just like, well, hey, man, you just cost me some money here. Yeah. So I'm not going to let you kill slaves. But, you know, Indians, there was nothing to stop them to, yeah. from killing. So, um, yes, a lot of, uh, and I don't know how it worked out with my ancestors, but a lot of them, pretend, I'm, I'm Italian. <laughs> or I, you know, whatever. Yeah, whatever, would, yeah. You know, pretend to be something, something else, else because that was safer than being Indian. Well, mm -hmm. we need to take a break yeah. and we will come back and tell us more about yeah. the Indians. All right, okay. Okay, okay. great. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness.
veteran. My victory was finding the strength to be a champion. My victory is having a job I can be proud of. At DAV, we help veterans get the benefits they've earned. My victory was finishing my education. My victory was getting help to put our lives back together. DAV provides veterans with a lifetime of support. My victory is being there for my family. Help us support more victories for veterans. Go to DAV. Aloha. I'm Marcia, and we are back. We are talking about Native Americans with David Molnix. Hmm. And David, uh, I must tell you, David works at the Bishop Museum. Yeah. And so if you want to go and have a conversation with David, that's the place to go. The museum is absolutely magnificent. It is fantastic. So yeah. I'm, I'm inviting them to come visit you. All right. <laughs> so tell us, you know, from the time that the Americans or the, the British or Colonist, whoever yeah. first stepped on to Florida. Yeah. Tell us about what happened then. Because yeah. these are people that have been there forever. Right. Yes. So now you get somebody that plants a flag and yes. says, right. this is ours. Yeah. So what happens? Generally, um, generally what happened was that, um, you know, Indians were traders, loved to trade. That was like, you know, so it trade all the time. So here come these, these colonists, or these folks who have like metal knives and metal pots, you know, and these are pretty handy, you know, because yeah. uh, if you don't have a metal pot to cook in, it's, you're really limited on how you can cook your food. So, and then, you know, beads and all kinds of fancy clothing and stuff. So they were really excited about trading. And so the trading started, and, and of course, these guys who first got there were rich guys, and they had no skills at all in camping or building or whatever, and they did bring a few, you know, peons uh, to help them do that stuff, but they died off because they didn't have a whole lot of, you know, uh, good food and all that, so pretty soon you've got these rich guys who, you know, have these forts and stuff who don't know how to do anything, and they're starving, and, uh, and that was pretty common, you know, uh, so they started stealing the food of the Indians, and, and so first their Indians are helping them, saying, oh, let us give you some food and you know, we'll help you get settled here and we'll do this all great trading and you guys can have this piece of land and it, you know, it was all doing, that's the way that the you know, Native people saw it happening. But um, as soon as the colony got strong enough and they had enough weapons, then they would just go and, uh, and start taking. Okay, well we're, now we're taking this land and you're gonna sign this treaty. And um, indigenous people really didn't, I mean they talk about the chiefs and stuff, but really, it, it's not like, you know, they, they show it in the movies. The chiefs were like representatives, and they really didn't have like, you know, bossing people around. It really was, they were more like representing the people. So the stories like Chief Joseph, they have this great story of him, you know, fighting the Americans all the way up to Canada, and he is this brilliant military leader and all that. And really, they're all sitting around the council, and they said, which way should we go? And then they would all like, oh, we like that way. We'll go that way, you know, Joseph. And so they would go that way. And that was kind of, it's kind of the history of really indigenous people, as well as like even the civil rights. I mean, Martin Luther King was not the leader of the civil no. rights movement. He was a representative. Mm -hmm. So, but for a capitalism of the American society, you need a leader so you can, you can corral that guy to get what you want. And so um, that's what they did. So they would, and if they couldn't get the chief to do it, the chief, they would say, you're the chief. They would pick somebody, get him drunk and say, okay, now you're the you're chief. Not. <laughs> sign this piece of paper, and they'd take the land. So, um, and Indians were pretty smart. They weren't going to wait around for someone to come and kill them, and they were really, that, you know, they were good warriors. So the Americans really couldn't, the Americans, the British, the French, really couldn't beat them in, in war because they were not going to, you know, run into bullets and all that. They would hide behind trees and all the, the standard and stuff. And they knew the land. They knew the land very well. Uh, so the, the policy, and this is, was the policy of all the folks that were doing wars at that time, is you go to the villages, kill all the women and children, burn the village to the ground, and then the men would quit. And that is how the Indian Wars across the United States were fought. That was literally, it was a genocide. And it started practically from day one, and that was basically what was going on. So all these big hero stories of Custer or whoever, you know, fighting the Indians, you know, that Custer, prior to the battle prior to that, that's what he did. He grabbed the women and children, and so the warriors didn't attack him. But he had murdered women and children in the village prior, uh, a few years earlier. So that was the policy. 
uh, uh, because Indians weren't considered people. So that that still is around today. You know, I mean, um, you know, in the 1970s, people were still killing Indians. You know, and I don't know this still it's haven't really stopped. You know, because they're not seen as equal. The whole thing at Standing Rock, right? right? That is that is their land. They have a treaty that says so. The United States has no right to be there at all. Yet they force this pipeline through their land, completely ignoring the rights. They ignore treaty rights all the time. U.S. government completely ignores treaty rights. Doesn't doesn't give them any value at all. You know, they're oh we got to make sure we keep our treaty with you know Brazil, you know, but with American Indians. They ignore the treaty, you know. So anyway, so there's that kind of you know issue that has not been dealt with, and people kind of don't realize the real history. Do, do you still, even the modern day yeah. uh, tribes, do they still have that distrust? Is there still? Um, yeah, <laughs> you bet. Yeah, there's sure. still still this issue between the American government, especially the Department of the Interior. Yeah, yeah, no, because they know that the yeah they well see the whole the whole system of after the wars the whole system was set up this government system was set up it's not the American Indian system you're going to have a you know a president and a vice president and a tribal council well the only reason they set up the tribal council was so once again they had a leader or a, a group of leaders and if they didn't like them then they would find some guys give them the money make sure they got elected and then a tribal government would give them the coal the oil uranium, you know, so the tribal government often doesn't represent the people. It's representing the issues of the corporations. So that, that was one of the big wars were about. I, uh, many, seems like, I taught uh, a school in uh, New Mexico, a tiny little Catholic school, Father John B. Hay, and there were nothing but Mascalera yeah. Indians. And it was so pitiful. The land was so bad. Right. Uh, it, it, it was just sad. And these little kids, and well, you've known me a long time. Yeah. I smile all the time. Right. These little kids never smiled. Right. It, there was a sadness, right. and, and my heart just broke all right. the time, just looking at these kids. There was nothing you could do to make them smile. Right. Yeah. The most extreme poverty is on Indian reservations, you know, the, the, the most destitution, the, the most lack of resources, the most lack of ability to move up or move out. out. Yeah, you know? there was nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go, right. You're completely trapped in destitution. And yeah. uh, there was this old, the trading post yeah. at the bottom of the hill, at the bottom of the mountain, and the... Uh, Native people would come down and bring what they called old pawns, mm -hmm. beautiful work that they had created with yeah. the turquoise and the silver. And then the Howley guy that owned the store would sell it to yeah. whoever was driving by. Right. And it, it just terrified me to think that this was, uh, my husband was in the military, so that's the reason we were in New Mexico. Right. To begin with, right, and it just it, it just ate at me to see these little kids. Now they tell me they have uh, casinos, right. which of course is another way to rip them off. Right, but at least yes, it is. So right now, one of the big problems, and a lot of Native people are trying to bring to attention, is the missing women. Women, are, especially with all these fracking and oil uh, camps, you know. Uh, indigenous women all across the United States are disappearing, you know, they're being raped, they're being murdered, they're being, you know, and they're just disappearing. So they have these man camps set up, you know, they're putting in the pipelines and, and you know, there's Indian women are disappearing. It's a big, big problem and there's a whole movement to try to bring attention to it. Um, so it's, 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 it's really hard. One of the things when I was at Standing Rock um, was that one of the, we were protesting the putting in the pipeline because it was completely illegal. And so um, they're arresting people illegally for, and pe we were peaceful, nonviolent. The police were brutal, uh, tear gas and rubber bullets and all this sort of stuff. So they arrested a bunch of folks. <clears throat> and then um, there was a couple of white guys in the group that got arrested. So this 
a white kid, you know, he's a teenager and he goes to court like he's supposed to and he's in all the room with him, only one of the white guy and all these Indians and, and, uh, and the, um, they're going through all, come up and, you know, and they had the charge of initially of, you know, trespassing. Well, they started throwing all these felonies, resisting arrest, violent, you know, whatever, just one felony and just loading up felonies and the, and the kid's going, wow, I was just standing there. Well, I'm going to get a felony because everybody was getting a felony, one Indian after another and, he was, and many. And so he's getting really scared. And so he comes up to and he's Latin and the judge says, what are you guys doing here? And it's like, well, we came to our trial. And he goes, what? You guys don't belong here. You belong downstairs. You're in the wrong courtroom. And they, but these are the guys we got arrested with. And then he goes, no, 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 go downstairs. So they go downstairs and the judge goes, okay, great. Um, uh, trespassing, uh, okay, case dismissed or community service, whatever it was, you know, you can go. And the kid realizes, oh my God, the Indians, for getting all these felonies, mm -hmm. and I'm let go because I'm white. This is this is North Dakota today. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not a hundred years ago. This is how the mentality of the people of North or the you know of that system today. The racism is so still intense. So that you know, that that just oh, that just breaks my heart to even think. Yeah. Now my granddaughter, who lives in Seattle, uh, went to, yeah. of course, you know, with me as a grandmother, what else would she do but right. show up? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Yes. Her mother was not happy, but yeah. grandma was, yay! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so she was there. And she was saying, you know, at least they again looked at her and said, you're not Indian. Yeah. What are you doing here? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, but she's protesting and what have you. Yeah. But I was so proud of her. And she says the same thing, that how she was just pushed aside. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's, there's still this, this racist mentality that exists, you know. And it's not just, you know, it's also going on in South America. I mean, there, there are a lot of indigenous leaders or indigenous folks who've stood up to say you can't cut down all the forest and all that. And they're, they're being murdered, assassinated one right after another. I mean, I, I don't remember how many it's been now, but there's like scores that have been murdered, you know, in South America. Uh, they're indigenous and they're leaders, so, you know, they just do it. Yeah, well, that's why I'm sorry that Beatrice isn't here because yeah. her mother is comes from one of those tribes, yeah. and she has the great stories about that. Yeah, but I think, you know, the indigenous, you know, what's gotten me through my life is my indigenous heritage, is, the, is that, that respecting the earth, respecting the family, you know, looking out for the people. I mean, that's, that's what I do. You know, yes. and all my involvement, right? <laughs> yeah. that, that is what's back of what I do. That's why I'm not afraid. That's why I go forward and just, because I know this is my, my responsibility. You know, the warrior wasn't, you know, brave because he was getting all these honors. He, you know, he was brave because he was protecting the family, he was protecting the people. And that, and that is our duty. That's our destiny. That's, that's who we are, you know? So that's, that's kind of how I see it. You know, it's like, but it isn't just, you know, the indigenous people, it's all the people. This, this is our family here in Hawaii. And it's like Martin Luther King, right? Yeah. He was for civil rights, but at the end, he was yeah. for all the oh, poor. You know, he says this is for human rights. Yes, yes, and that he had moved, completely moved, moved in a different yes. direction by that point. Mm -hmm. And so, and, um, so yeah, that's what we, we all need to be doing, looking out well, for each other. Thank you mm -hmm. for looking out for everyone, and thank you so much for spending this time with us. And you will come back. Oh, that'd be oh, great. Great. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll come back to the museum and yeah. talk to you some more. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Aloha.